Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome. This is the fourth Sunday of Lent, and welcome to St. Michael's Outside the Walls. We gather together in prayer this day, and thank you for welcoming us into your homes as we begin this time together. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Together we pray. Almighty oh God, God, to you, you all hearts are open, open all desires known, and, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord is with you. And, and also with you. Let us pray. Glorious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that we may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Together we pray our welcoming prayer. Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, living, living within, within us, guide our hearts and minds as, as we welcome today all those who worship with us at St. Michael's. Michael's. Give us discerning hearts so that everyone who crosses our threshold feels welcome in the spirit of your love. Help us to recognize each person as an individual sent by you who will enrich our lives. And most of all, God, let this place be a place of welcome acceptance of all your children. In the name of your child, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now listen to our readings for today. Our first reading happens at a time of transition. Saul has been found to be an unfit king by the Lord and Samuel, who is, give, who is grieving the loss of his mentor and friend, is nonetheless the one to go against Saul and seek out a new king for the Israelites. Saul sure had looked and seen the part of a king with his height and self-confidence, yet he disappointed. What way will Samuel find to select a true king pleasing to the Lord? reading from the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to me in trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, they looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, 
do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks to God. Our second reading today comes from the letter to the Ephesians. The letter considered by many scholars to be mainly focused on being an instructional guide to an early church where many of the differences between Jew and Gentile had settled into a new church culture. Having now become a church family, the focus here is how to live a godly life in Christian unity. Today we hear about how practicing discernment can help. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention that such people do secretly, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. about COVID-19 has been updating, it seems, by the hour and forcing us to find new ways to work and socialize, new ways to take care of ourselves and our children. It's been hard for us not to hug each other, not to meet at church and worship together, not to see our vulnerable, vulnerable family members or co-workers for fear of spreading the virus. And the worst of it all is the uncertainty. What's the true information out there about the virus? How can we know that we're being safe for ourselves and for those around us? How will we pay our bills and keep functioning in this new normal? How long will this go on for? What will the church look like when all of this is done? There are many questions, and for now, we cling to what we know as answers. Wash your hands, self-distance, call your friends and your loved ones often, keep connected, 
go, gro go grocery shopping for those who are homebound. Say your prayers and have faith that this too shall pass. Surely we are not blind, are we? We ask. We need the light of Jesus now more than ever. Today's gospel, oddly, although it deals with the miracle of healing and restored sight, reads a lot like the confusion and panic and sometimes dysfunctional coping strategies that we see around us today. The story starts simply enough. Jesus encounters a man unable to see from birth. The blind man in the story, as it would seem. And yet when the disciples speak, we see the blinders with which they are looking at and judging the man's blindness. As a punishment, he received for his sins or for those of his parents. This was surely a common belief at the time. And let's face it, it's not like this is an attitude that has really disappeared altogether. We have only to think back to the blame and shame placed on the gay community during the panic surrounding the AIDS uh, epidemic in the 80s and 90s. When we look around with fear and uncertainty today, how can we be sure that we're not sliding into blindness? I think about the situation of one of my oldest friends who's Japanese and presently stuck in Hawaii trying to get back home, and her daily posts about people looking at her with extra suspicion right now. I think about my own treatment of my colleague who was sent home from work on Friday because he'd been at the U.S. hockey game in Oakland County. Was I kind enough to him as he left? Or did my fears blind me into being overcome only by worry? Jesus' response invites all of those of us who would follow him to see beyond our fear and our worry beyond the blindness of preconceptions and prejudgments. Instead, Jesus offers healing, wholeness and community to the blind man and to us as an alternative. He proceeds to heal him with the saliva from his own mouth and to return him to the religious community and to his family. And he asks him to perform a ritual of purification in the pool of Siloam. His return to the community, however, brings to light more blindness all around him. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? So he learns a painful truth, that his neighbors, his family, and the religious authorities seem only to be able to see him and in his circumstance, his former circumstance as a beggar and as a blind man. And his new normal throws them into a world of stress and chaos. They were, they were now faced with a man who was whole, healed, and empowered with the good news and the miracle that had just happened to him, his miraculous change and their reactions are predictable, even comical at times. From the odd confusion by those who have known him his whole life and yet can't recognize him or not sure who he is anymore, to the Pharisees' threatened response at Jesus' miracle to his families nervously washing their hands of him, perhaps out of fear of the Pharisees and what they might do to them. His transformation seems to make everybody uncomfortable, except the now sighted man himself. So this story begs us to question ourselves about the boxes 
that we put ourselves and others we share our lives with in. And to approach change, even uncomfortable change, with an eye to where God is moving and working. For surely God is there. So it's perfectly visible to the blind, formerly blind man what just happened. Jesus saw him for who he was, a man created, made whole in the image of God. Jesus loved him, and he restored his sight, and he sent him off to be fully blessed and to be fully returned to the community. In our Old Testament reading from 1 Samuel, we hear that the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Jesus looked at the blind beggar and saw him as God's hurting, beloved child and restored him to who he was created to be. In our reading from Ephesians, we hear that we all, like the man born blind, once were in darkness, but now in the Lord, we are light, and we are to live in the light. By the end of the Gospel story, Jesus returns, and the man born blind, just like the woman at the well from last Sunday's Gospel, is asked if he believes in the Son of Man. The now seeing man asks who he is and receives the same answer. You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. And his immediate answer is, Lord, I believe. Jesus is the light. And the, man, and the man born blind is the only one here who truly sees. He sees because he believes, because of his faith. And through his witness, he sheds light on Jesus' true nature, blessing all of us with his vision. In this time of social isolation, uncertainty, and difficult adaptations. We definitely can feel like everything about us is ever-growing darkness. Already before this last week, we were starting to ask ourselves increasingly at St. Michael's about all the ways that we have been raised to be blind. Blind to the social injustices and evils around us, like racism, and white supremacy. And now it takes just about as much energy as we can muster to keep the anxiety down, the loneliness at bay, and remember how to be church. But I have seen St. Michael's practicing vision and not blindness just in the last few days, keeping hands outstretched to the light and being the light. From the constant care and companionship of the Facebook chat group, to the love and care expressed in Paula's robocalls, to the devotion of the band, and all of our worship leaders putting on last Sunday's worship, to the blessing of the Zoom checkup with our beloved Bishop Bonnie, not to mention the ongoing volunteering of calls, food donations, and the spreading of good information to keep everybody safe and informed. And the information on where help is to be found in the community. In more ways than one, St. Michael's has been practicing vision in the midst of blindness. And in the midst of the present darkness, we have been seeing beyond the walls of our homes 
and of our church to those in the community who might be hurting. Dear St. Michael's Church family, Jesus breaks down our isolation and sheds light into our darkest moments. And he bids that we keep up that good work. Each and every one of you are seeing, showing love, and showing up in real ways to heal and bless and keep people connected to the community. Keep practicing vision. Keep fighting the blindness. Keep remembering that we are part of the body of Christ and that we have his light. Hold on to it, my friends. Keep it glowing bright, and you shall see. This too shall pass. Amen. Amen. We need prayers, and I invite your prayers as we join together for the needs of our church, our nation, and all of our families of St. Michael's. Let us pause and remember. For our church, for our Bishop Bonnie, for all our priests, deacons, our volunteers, and vestry, we pray to the Lord, Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer, for our nation, for our leaders, for all who make decisions that affect not only us, but all of those people who are hurting, the ones that are pushed to the margins of our world. We pray to the Lord, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer, for each one on our St. Michael's prayer list, for those who are already compromised in health, for those who are lonely and just afraid of what awaits them, for each one of us we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for each one of you, we pause now for a moment to remember those prayers that you voice in your heart right now. For these prayers, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We close our prayers together with Psalm 23, the psalm that is appointed for today. Together we pray. The Lord, Lord is my shepherd. shepherd. I, I shall, shall not be he makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we close, let me bless you. May the peace of the Lord be with you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he always look upon you with love and give you his comfort, his love, compassion, and peace 
in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We close with a song as we lean on the everlasting arms of our Savior.